Welcome to Questacon. I'm Graham Durant. I'm the director here. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here, particularly you guys from Nimaji School. Thank you for coming in today. You're going to have a really exciting talk. It made me think that when I was a teenager, 50 years ago, I was watching this little grainy black and white television of man's first step onto the moon. Your generation are going to watch not only men and women going back to the moon, but you're going to watch the first people stepping foot on Mars. That's my prediction. So when you're my age, you'll be able to look back and say, yep, I remember when mankind first stepped onto the surface of Mars. So how exciting is that? Space is really fascinating, and we're lucky in Australia that there's now such a focus on space, particularly with the founding of a new Australian space agency. And it's my pleasure to welcome the uh, CEO of that space agency to say a few words, Dr. Megan Clark. Thanks, Graham, and thank you all for being here. I'm also here not really to introduce Badri, although I will do that, but I'm actually here as a student to learn from Badri today. So I'm, I'm joining this audience exactly the same reason that you are here. Um, you are truly honoured to be able to hear from Dr. Badri Yunus. He's the Deputy Associate Administrator and Program Manager for NASA's Space Communication and Navigation. What that means is he looks after all aspects of communication at NASA, between the Earth, in space, with what's happening in space, in deep space. Um, so you are truly hearing from an expert, and I don't want to stand between that and your learning. So Badri, uh, my good friend, yeah. um, it is a pleasure to introduce you, and I know you will enthrall this audience. Thank, thank you, mate. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to make a correction. I don't think that you are the generation that you are going to see people landing on Mars. You are, going, you are the generation that you are going to land on Mars. As I look around, I see future astronauts, scientists, engineers, educators. You know, you guys have the foundation for shaping the future and carrying on with what NASA is doing, with what uh, NASA is all about. And what are we all about? Exploration. I'm so happy, you know, that Australia has finally, you know, set up the Australian Space Agency under the leader leadership of Dr. Clark. Uh, many of you in the past wonder where to go next. How do you apply your knowledge? How do you shape the future? Now you have something, you know, uh, that provides some focus and a roadmap for all of you. So please, all of you, you know, work with the space agency, look toward the space agency as a mean to apply your capabilities and what you are learning to shape the future. So good to be with you. I'm always so happy to be here down in Australia. I always thought Australia down under is the best place to see the world way up above. And <laughs> we, that's why we, for the past 60 years, we've had this great relationship with Australia. It's a partnership, true partnership. We have it with uh, CSIRO, and we collaborate on space. And CSIRO, as you all know, manages and operates the deep space uh, station here in uh, Tinbimbilla. And I know many of the students in here come come from that area, so I, I hope you all have visited that, uh, that deep space station. Uh, let me introduce uh, my team in here. Uh, you know, I'm not alone, you know, and I'm not the, the one who's doing things, making things happen at NASA. We have a team, we, we work in team. Teamwork is essential, you know, the collective power and knowledge of the, the, the many is by far better than knowledge and the power of the one. So always work in team, you know, collaborate together to make things happen. You can get there faster and better. So let me introduce Fartin from Su Chang. She leads our network services. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Marcus Watkins. You know. Barbara Addy. 
and Susie Dodd, as well as Greg Mann. Why am I introducing these folks? Not to show you their pretty faces, but to tell you or to show you that among them, I have three capable women. You know, NASA, you know, uh, is a good place for everyone. And we've demonstrated that women in leadership position can make things happen. Among these three ladies, I have this lady, Susie Dodd. She has gone where no one has gone before. She has two spacecraft that have gone beyond the solar system into the interstellar area. That's about 20 billion kilometers away from here. And she's still going. And thanks to her and her technical expertise and management and leadership, we made it over there. And so many of you ladies over here can do the same thing. You have the potential, as well as the guys, to do the same thing, to go where no one has gone before. And we need to do that. But first, let me talk a little bit about myself. This is my name. It's hard to pronounce, you know, and hard to remember. Badri Yunis. I'm presently the Deputy Associate Administrator. I have overall responsibility for all space communication and navigation for NASA. What does it mean? I'm responsible for to develop, operate, and manage all space communication capabilities. We develop the technology as well as we take care of the utilization of the radio frequencies, the radio spectrum, because without the spectrum, we cannot do science and we cannot communicate. And we, uh, we work on making sure that we work the standards such that everyone can talk when machines connect to each other, you know, the flow of information can take place. And we work with international uh, entities and we represent NASA in these discussion negotiating on their behalf. We do all of this because we have a lot of responsibilities. On a daily basis, we support more than 100 spacecraft flying either in the near Earth or far away, all the way to the interstellar areas. And we do that 27, 24-7. That's mean around the clock, you know, we have science missions flying through, uh, through space, you know, transmitting data. And data coming out of sensors and instruments on board. This is our way of sensing and viewing and understanding the makeup of things or what's happening elsewhere. And this is where our asset located. Three different networks. They support different missions. You know, in particular, you know, we have the uh, near, near Earth. These are missions that fly around the globe, studying Earth, and connecting back and transmitting their data back through the polar region because they fly around the polar uh, areas. We also have the space network. These are stationed up in space, and they see all, everything that's happening under them. So when a mission flies around, you know, if the station in here and they cannot transmit the data to their station, they send the data to the satellite and the satellite send it back to Earth. And we also have the deep space network. And as you all know, one of these stations is down here in Tinbibilla. I hope you all have visited the place. And if you have not, why not? <laughs> It's a good place to visit. We have a visitor center that talks about the science we do. We do that in collaboration with the Australian um, uh, government, in particular CSIRO. And hopefully in the future, similar things we'll be doing with the Australian space agencies. Australia is on its way to carve a place for itself within, this, within the space industry. So uh, we have a number of antennas. One of them is so huge, 70 meter wide, and the other smaller size antennas. So please, if you have not visited our place, go there. So 
Why do we do that? Because we are curious by, by our nature. We are always wondering about what's out there. Are we alone? Are there other planets or human beings or other beings elsewhere? You know, we need to understand where we came from, where we are going. And we study the, so many things to answer these questions. We explore. Australians, by their very nature, are explorers and pioneers. You have that spirit within you. And this is the kind of spirit that's going to carry, you know, Australia into the future. And not only is Australia, mankind all together. We are really counting on you guys, you know, to go into the future. So let's explore. Can I show the video? 50 years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. Very pretty out here. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. A space launch system. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and to stay, to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The Moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. We are definitely going. How many of you would like to be an astronaut? <laughs> uh, because of the light, I don't see clearly up there, but I hope many of you say, okay, <laughs> this is good. 
being an astronaut is a good thing because you can go to places where no one has been before and really explore in person. But is this the only thing NASA does? No. Much of the, our exploration is done you know, using robotic mission other than relying on human. They prepare the way, they pave the way for human to go there. We have spacecraft that go all throughout the, the heavens to study the planets and beyond and to study the universe as well as spacecraft that study Earth. So that's what we do. We study Earth, we, we do heliophysics. Heliophysics is a study of the sun and the heliosphere. We study the planets and we do astrophysics. We look at the heart of the universe, try to see whether there are planets or elsewhere and the origin of the universe. How, how were we created and where are we going? So let's begin our journey. Our journey starts with Earth. And why do we study Earth? Why do you think we study Earth? I'm giving you the answer on the, <laughs> on the slide. <laughs> because we would like to understand you know, how to improve our ability to forecast natural hazards, be that the ones that are natural, you know, naturally made or the things that are man-made. Everything is just to ensure that human beings and their quality of life is preserved or improved. Uh, we study Earth because that's the only place we know, you know where human exists. We study Earth because we are trying to understand what enables life. Why is it Earth? You know, there are many things that enters into the nature of Earth and its ability to support life. In particular, we have water on the surface. There is something we call a magnetic field, a, ma a magnetosphere around the Earth that's protecting it. It's like a bubble protecting the, 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 the Earth from outside hazards. Our proximity to the sun, we are just about the right distance from the sun. Our atmosphere, you know, it's a very delicate balancing environment, you know, balanced environment that exists over there. And uh, we are looking at the Earth by itself. It's a highly dynamic Earth. It's a living Earth. It's not a dead, like a dead rock, you know. There are things that are happening inside, making the planet real lively, more dynamic, a living planet. And we look at also the organic molecules, you know, the basic element for life to exist. There are a number of components that are associated with, with Earth. The geosphere, the hydrosphere, the, atmos the atmosphere, the uh, cryosphere, and the biosphere. But before I get to that, I'd like to talk about the Earth itself, the makeup of the Earth. At the heart of the Earth, inside, we have the core. You know, the core is because, you know, the, the gravitation of forces and because of the spinning of the Earth is under a lot of pressure, and there is the weight of everything on it. So it's extremely hot. It's like about 5,000 to 6,000 degrees Celsius. It's almost as hot as the surface of the sun. But because of all of this pressure on it, it's like solid. Now, as you move to the outer core, you know, there's less pressure. And because of the heat, the iron, and also there is nickel there, is like, it's, it's, it's melted, it's fluid. And then you go to, you know, the, uh, the mantle, and then the outer mantle, and all the way to the crust. You know that the crust, where we live, and the oceans and everything, the mountains that we have, and, you know, everything that, uh, you know, we know, is only, you know, probably so thin like the skin of an apple. The rest, is the, you know, inside, that has nothing to do you know, with life as we know it, but is very essential to life. What's happening in here? Because of the heat generated inside, you know, it's like when you are boiling water, you know, the heat comes from the bottom, goes up, and the cold things go down. There is a convection process taking place. We call it convection current. Can, what, what's up? 
Excuse me? Yeah, yeah. But, we, you know, I would welcome questions. But for, for me, let me finish with the presentation, and I can answer all of your questions at the end, OK? And so this uh, convection current and also the spinning of the Earth, this uh, swirling whirlpool because of the spinning of the Earth, create an elect electric current that, uh, you know, create also a, a magnetic field. The sum of all of magnetic fields, you know, generated uh, in, uh, inside by this process create a big magnetic bubble around Earth. And that's very essential for life to exist on Earth. And I will talk, I will get to it later on. The other uh, component of Earth, there is a delicate balance between what's happening in here. You know, Earth, the, the upper, uh, uh, you know, structure of Earth is riding on about 15 uh, plates. We call them tectonic plates that are not stable. They keep on moving. They create mountains. They create valleys. We are talking about the biosphere. Every biological thing that exists, you know, every living thing participate in, the, in this process, from plants to animals to everything. We are all part of this biosphere. The cryosphere, the amount of snow and ice, you know, is our big reservoir for potable water. And also, the amount of ice on Earth is so critical because what happened, the ice reflects energy, you know, and reflects at least one third of the energy coming from the sun, keeping the temperature in the, in the, uh, around Earth you know, very toler tolerable, otherwise would have had, will have had a uh, much hotter environment. The atmosphere, this balance that exists in the atmosphere, the composition of the atmosphere, you know, if all of these things are so very much interrelated, you know. So the interconnection, all of these things, we can, I can give you a couple of examples. One of them in the, um, the water cycle and the other, the carbon cycle. You know, as you all know, the water, you know, what happened in the ocean, whatever, because of the sun, you know, it evaporates, then, you know, the wind and everything moves, moves it around, and then it, you have condensation, and then you have rainfall, it comes down in the form of uh, snow, and, uh, and so on. It's a continuous process. The same thing with carbon, you know. The carbon cycle is so critical because, you know, the amount of carbon in the air is something that needs to be to remain at a certain level. Otherwise, the amount of uh, you know the there will be uh, uh, the kind of temperature that may impact the quality of life on Earth and probably be detrimental our to our presence on Earth. That's why the amount of you know the the, the forest, whether it's on the on the surface or underneath the ocean, are so critical to taking these carbon dioxide from the air and transform it back into oxygen and carbon that can be stored back in, in the Earth. Anything that we do from, uh, you, know, ar you know, around Earth, you know, the, 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 the cars that we, we, we drive and all of these things do affect that. They produce the kind of things that maybe, may, that are impacting to the environment. So this balance is so critical for life to continue. And how do we study that? The study of Earth, you know, in the past we relied on balloons. The you know, balloons, these are huge balloons. Each balloon, you know, can contain the size of about 100 uh, Goodyear blimp, if you are all, all familiar with that. So they are so huge. The material is made out of thin nylon, you know, and uh, they fly way up high, like 60,000 feet or about, may do the conversion, about 20 kilometers up in the, in the air. And they drift, and we study the weather, and we study, uh, you know, uh, many things around the Earth because of, you know, uh, with instrument on board. We also have aircrafts that fly and also have instruments. And they measure so many things. They, they measure the amount of carbon. They measure the, 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 the you know, the amount of water. Uh, you know, all of these studies, uh, as well as buoys in the ocean, they study the temperature of the ocean and so on. And um, they are, all of this thing is collected and scientists use all of the data using computer model to assess the state of health uh, of, of, of the Earth and also the various components that will impact the quality of life. 
But for the most part, starting in the 1960, you know, we started to use satellite. We fly satellites, you know, and we collaborate with other nations. NASA is not the only one that does that. We work with other space agencies. And in the future, we'll be working with the Australian Space Agency to collaborate on the study of Earth. And so you guys better start, you know, you better start thinking about that, you know, to carve yourself a place in our scientific environment to do something that's so great, the study of the Earth, as well as the study of other things to serve humanity and to better the life for mankind. So this is, you know, what we have a number of, did, did we go over the satellite one? Well, you know? Okay, this is a train of, you know, uh, we call it the A train, a number of satellites, they measure just about everything from the amount of carbon to so many things up in the air and give us some data, you know, that we study from, you know, for Earth observation purposes. So, uh, and also, we definitely, all of this, the data coming from all of these satellites has to be communicated somehow, and that's what we're, myself and my, my colleague here uh, come into play, because without communication, all of these satellites will be pieces of junk up in space. You know, the, the data is transmitted back to our ground stations, and then they are transmitted to the scientists where they are further evaluated. We use different kind of networks for that. In particular, I talked about it, the Near Earth Network, where, you know, the satellite goes around and, and dumps the data to these polar areas, and then the data goes, uh, you know, through ground connection to the, science, uh, to the, uh, the investigator to, to collect it and study it. We also use the space network to do that, and from up, from, uh, from up in space, we have visibility to everything that goes around Earth. So anything that uh, all data collected are around there, you know, will be able to make it through to its proper dest destination. Next thing we study, guess what? The sun, heliophysics, the origin of all life around Earth. Without the sun, there is no Earth. And the sun impacts our life on Earth, you know, drastically. And what do we study about the sun? We study the sun itself, you know, and the sun, as you all know, is a giant ball of gas. It's about uh, a million times the size of Earth. And what I mean is that within the sun, you can f uh, fit about a million Earths. And uh, the, the sun is the mother of all of the planets in our solar system. What does it do? And with the composition of the sun, the same thing, the thing we talked about Earth, there is a core. And in the core, you know, there is like a nuclear reactor taking place. The pressure and the heat over there, you know, take the hydrogen, you know, uh, nuclei, nuclei in here and transform them into helium. It takes four uh, hydrogen nuclei and fuse them together to produce a single uh, helium nucleus. And we know the helium is weighs a little bit less than the, than the hydrogen. So what happened to the rest of the mass of these four uh, hydrogen nuclei? They are transformed into heat. And this heat propagates upward. And we have a radiative, uh, radiative zone in here. And where you have so much heat and that translates into, uh, you know, into, the, uh, into the convection uh, zone to create something similar to what happened on Earth, create a certain magnetic field and magnetic energy, you know. And um, all of this causes a number of things to happen. This heat and this, uh, the, this heat, these heated particles that come in from the sun, we define as the solar wind. These are highly charged particles that are constantly transmitted by the sun. In addition to this steady stream of, uh, of you know, particles, we also have 
number of uh, electromagnetic explosions that take, that take place in here. One of them is the coronal mass ejection, a, you know, a, like a bubble of gas heating up and bubbling to the surface and expanding as it go outward, and then boom, a massive electromagnetic explosion take place, and uh, you know, and a lot of additional, uh, you know, he heavily charged particle, you know, come and propagate through space. But they are slow. They are heavy. They take a while to get to Earth. About eight days. The other ones that are more dangerous are the solar flare. You know, we talked about the sun being a, a, you know, a ball of gas. So it's more fluid. The movement of things is not like the Earth, where the Earth is solid on the outside. So the electromagnetic field around, around the sun is different from the Earth. And the, uh, around Earth, they are pretty defined, and they are also aligned. You know, around the sun, the electromagnetic field they get wind, you know, wound up around the, in so many different directions. And sometimes they, they get mingled together. And when that happens, it creates an, a, a very intensive electromagnetic field causing solar flares. You know, these are, you know, like explosion, electromagnetic, uh, you know, kind of uh, highly charged plasma or, you know, highly charged particle that are emitted into space. And they come to Earth, they can get to Earth within eight minutes. They are very fast. These are the kind of photons that are highly charged that are going through space. But what's good about our environment and our you know, magnetosphere, it protects us. You know, as these things, highly charged particles, come here to hit the Earth's environment, this electromagnetic field that around the, the Earth push them back. Not only that, they get diverted. When they hit the Earth, they start to slow down because of the, this, what we call the bow shot zone. And this is the, you know, um, you know, they are pushing against the electromagnetic field. At the same time, the electromagnetic magnetic field pushing them out, so they get diverted. And that's what protects us. If this did not exist, all of these highly charged particles would come to Earth and they strip Earth from everything. All, every, anything that fly, all of the molecules in the air and everything gets stripped out. And as you all know, you heard about the aurora, the aurora, aurora borealis and the aurora australis. Do you know what the origin of the, na of the name of Australia come from? What does Australia mean? Southern land. Southern light, terra australis, you know, southern, southern land. And that's what we have. We have. As these things, the, these uh, highly charged uh, particles go around the, 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 you know, are captured by our electromagnetic field, they are taken to the poles. And as they enter the, the, the atmosphere, they interact with the, the nitrogen and the oxygen in the air, and they give us these beautiful light. Oxygen can give us light like green and sometimes yellow and so on, while the nitrogen gives us the, the beautiful blue color. And it happens, you know, on both sides of the, the planet. So, so I'm talking like about the sun as, as if the sun is a bad thing. No. These, this solar wind go to the edge of the solar system and protect us because the sun is not the only star out there. There are plenty of stars everywhere, you know. And all of them are transmitting similar highly charged particles. So our sun, you know, send this solar wind and push against all of the interstellar wind that's coming, all of the bad things coming at us from outside. And so the sun is protecting its babies while, you know, the babies are supposed to be grown up to protect themselves from mommy, you know. So this is a very delicate balance. And, you know, look at the sun. The sun alone is 99.8 of the total mass of the solar system. That's a huge thing, you know. That's a very big thing. All of the rest of the planets is just 0.2% of the rest of the mass. And we will, we, you know, and then we can talk about the planets. You know, there are two different types of uh, planets, the inner planet and the outer planet. And 
NASA and other space agencies do study the planet. Do we know why? Why do you think we study the other planets? What's going on? Why? Because we'd like to know, you know, how our solar system was formed. In order to understand the total solar system, you need to see the various elements and components of the solar system. Go ahead. Bingo, that's another thing. Did life ever exist there? And if it did exist, what happened to it? And could what happened over there happen on Earth? And how can we protect ourselves? So all of these things are reasons why we study the other planets. To, better, to, to have a better understanding and better appreciation how to preserve life in here. And to see if life is possible in the future in other planets, potentially, as we have taken to the oceans and to the seas to, to discover and inhabit a new land, we probably want to go one day to inhabit other planets. So among the planets that we study, and you know, although the moon is not a planet, but it's the closest heavenly body that's closer to Earth, and we try to study it. The beauty about the moon, it's a dead semi-planet. Nothing going on over there. At one time, it used to have volcanoes, so it was a little bit active, living. But about 100 million years during the time of dinosaur, volcanoes stopped. The, the moon became like a dead rock, empty. You know, there is nothing to it. Recently, we discovered there is plenty of ice at the southern pole of the, of the moon. But the good thing about the moon, because there is no water, no nothing, you know, it has a good memory. Everything that has happened over 100 million years has been captured by the moon. It has captured the heartbeat of the solar system. You know, and by going there, we can study what has happened over the past 100 million years. Because there is no rain, no nothing, no earthquake to change the topography or rain to cause runoff. So everything has been preserved. So it's a pristine place to study what has happened and the effect of the various cosmic uh, you know, phenomena on our solar system. So we have a spacecraft called LRO, which is Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has been flying around the moon for the, for the past 10 years, giving us these kind of critical data. We also study Mars. Mars has been the planet the most studied. And presently, you know, we have a number of uh, vehicles and laboratories on the surface of Mars. You all know about JPL being the only entity that was able to land you know, vehicles and la rovers and landers on the space, on the surface of Mars. And they are presently going around studying the terrain, studying the, 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 the molecules that exist over there to draw conclusion. Does water exist and so on? But in 2020, JPL will be sending another thing, another vehicle, another lander or rover to study the, whether the, the uh, you know, life have ever existed over there to look, to look at the element of life that around Mars. And we are looking forward to get these kind of results. Mars has always fascinated us. It's a red planet. It's similar in size to Earth. It's a little bit smaller. It's a little bit distant from the sun. What it has also, it has all of these components that are similar to Earth. The only thing it does not have is this electromagnetic field that I talked about. The, that bubble that protects Earth doesn't exist around Mars. So radiation can strip just about anything. All of the molecules that exist around the planet can be stripped by the, 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 the solar wind and the space weather. We'd like to understand what happened. We know Mars at one time had active volcanoes. There, wa there is water. We discovered, like, you know, places where water once existed. Things that are carved in the, in the, in the, in the, the rocks and the, the topography that indicate there were, you know, water streams and rivers, potentially, and lakes. So the 2020 mission will give us these kind of, uh, kind of answers. We'll be looking at organic molecules. 
This is the basic component for life. So, you know, in the next few years, we'll be answering so many good questions. Okay, if life never existed, can life be supported over there? Can Mars at one time in the future, uh, you know, sometime in the future, be re-energized? We can make it a little bit more active to sustain life in the future? It's not that far away from Earth, you know. So it may be a good place to go to, you know, as we move forward into our solar system. We also study these big ball of gas, the other big planets. Saturn was always of interest because we we were fascinated by the rings and the, the, the moons around Saturn. And recently, we had a mission called uh, the Cassini that um, involved a number of space agencies. They went to study the rings around uh, the, the, the planets and uh, studied the moons over there, and studied the electromagnetic field. And after 20 plus years, we got them to go through the, the rings and make a plunge on the surface of the, the planet. We are trying to understand the nature of these gas balls. Jupiter is one of them. Saturn is one of them. Our understanding of these planets will help us to understand our own Earth, life and the origin of this solar system. And this is so critical to our evolution. And so I talked about Voyager. It's a major accomplishment. People just talk about the landing on the moon as a major accomplishment 50 years ago. Having a spacecraft crisscrossing the heavens for the past 40 years and going beyond the influence of our sun to go into the interstellar area is a major accomplishment. A spacecraft that survives all of the elements and got speed as it went around the very using the planets to push it forward, you know, to get to make it into the interstellar areas and still be able to transmit data. And that's a miracle of our ingenuity, what we are capable of. This spacecraft has a hundred watts, like a, one of these light, you know, light bulbs, transmitting data from 20 billion kilometers. That's not your next door city or whatever. That's pretty far away. And that's why we need the antennas that exist in Tenbimbilla. Because these spacecraft, we can only see them from the southern hemisphere, in particular from your, the station down here. Ed Cruzen is the station director. And he's doing us a big favor, helping NASA and the scientific community keep contact with these spacecraft, helping Susie with her two missions, you know, trying to discover what's out there beyond the solar system, looking at the interstellar radiation, the composition, and so on. These spacecraft are going to keep on going until they stop. And as long as we have the antenna down here, we are going to still support them. So this is what I'm talking about. Just imagine 20 billion kilometer. By the way, the data here is wrong. This was a few years back. We did not change the chart. Now we are at 13.4 billion miles, or about 20 billion kilometers. That's a long, long way. It took 40 years going at 50,000 miles per hour to get here. This is a major accomplishment, similar to the landing on the moon. And this is what I talked about. This is the kind of antenna. As this, the signal you know, gets weaker because the spacecraft gets farther and further in space, we need these big antennas. You know, these are giant ears that are so directed in a very narrow way to, the, to that spacecraft to pick up the signal. And in here, we have super duper electronics. You know, the power and the ingenuity of our engineer to come up with the kind of technology that will allow us to pick up very weak signal, despite the noise coming from everywhere. Anything that's happening around us can interfere with that signal. But yet we do it. And thanks to in large part to the ingenuity we have at our JPL uh, center, as well as the collaboration with the CSIRO folks, 
who are providing us with that tremendous service. You guys, you know, please, if you haven't been to the Hidden Villa, go and see these antennas. They are our, our Eiffel Towers. You know, even better. They are doing something, you know, in the service of humanity, not like sitting, not doing anything, just collecting tourist money. <laughs> and then from there, we move into the universe. Boy, the universe is so huge. How huge is it? Very huge. Why do we study it? You know, we try to study the origin of our, our life here on Earth. What's, what's happening? How did we come about? You know, our place in this universe. How relevant are we to the rest of the, the universe? Are there life elsewhere? Are, other planet, are there other planets in the universe similar to our planet? You can see here, this is our sun. These are our planet. What's in red here is Earth. This whole thing, the solar system, is just one point in a big galaxy. We call it the Milky Way. You know, we are 26 million light year from the center of this galaxy. This galaxy is about 100 million light years. What's a light year? It's a distance that a light traveled within a year. A travel, you know, a light traveled, you know, about 186 miles per second. Look what the light here is. Is five trillion eight hundred ta -ta -ta billion or whatever mark. Woo! That's pretty huge, isn't it? That's a big distance. And just to show you the sheer size of the universe. So when you see people pretending that they are bigger than life, look at this. Put things into perspective. You know, the, our entire solar system is nothing but a single point in a much larger universe. No one is bigger than life, you know. Life is much bigger than we are. And when you look at our galaxy, you know, it has 100 billion stars, like Earth. Just imagine that, 100 billion stars, that each star has so many planets around that like we have. And when you look at their you know, possibility of life elsewhere, we sent a spacecraft called Kepler. Started to look at our immediate neighborhood. And as of January 2019, in a small corner of the Earth, we discovered, you know, we have confirmed the existence of about 4,000 planets like Earth, where life could possibly exist. How about, however, they are like light years away from us. So how do we make contact? How relevant are we to them? And how relevant are they to us? This is the question that I'm hoping all of you would answer in the future. So if you look at not just our immediate neighborhood in the universe, you know, you know our, our neighborhood is 20 light years across. Our Milky Way, you know, uh, it talks about our spiral things, where are we located? This is our immediate neighborhood. And when you take this neighborhood and look at the whole neighborhood that we are talking about, it's just that small place in a much larger universe. There are about two trillion galaxies similar to our Milky Way. And each galaxy has 100 billion of stars. This is an infinite number. So the probability of other planets in our immediate neighborhood, we found 4,000 planets similar to Earth. In much larger things, there are millions, yet billions of planets similar to ours. And if they have the right condition for life that we have on Earth, they must have life on them. And there is no reason that that's not the case. And at the heart of most galaxies, there is a black hole, and I will talk about that. But if you are to count the number of stars up in space, there are more stars up in space than number of grain of sand on Earth. If you collect all of the sand on Earth, there are more stars than the number of grains of sand on Earth. This is much larger than anything. So what does it mean to us? I'd like to understand it. Would like, 
if there is life elsewhere, would like to make contact. That's why we need to evolve our technology, our capability to reach out and see what's out there. You know, I talk about the black hole. Do you all know what's a black hole? Okay, so a black hole is a, something that sucks up, you know, it has huge gravity, strong gravity. It sucks in energy, it does not send it out. It pulls it in. Even the light cannot escape from it, you know. And at the heart of each galaxy, there is a huge one like this that swallows things, you know. We don't understand what's happening inside of them. This is the kind of physics that I'm hoping many of you will pursue, so will help to help us understand. And we, you know, we didn't know about them. We, we suspected they existed. Einstein talked about them. You all heard about Einstein. Yeah, but we never demonstrated that until recently where we were able to measure it and to, to, to feel it, to see it, by the way the light bent around them. So, what am I talking about here? This is our universe. Our universe is not sitting still, keeps on expanding. You know, it's not contracted. Well, so, um, and it's not only expanding, it's, it's expanding, it's going larger and larger at an accelerated rate. And uh, we estimated that the age of this universe, 13.8 billion years. Some people put the age even much, much bigger than that that the universe has expanded and collapsed so many times. But these are all theories. No one, no one can prove that. So uh, what enters into play here is the makeup of the universe. You know, what we see and the planets and those things that emit light or reflect light is only about 5% of the total universe. 26% is, you know, um, or 95% altogether is something that we cannot see. We know it's there. Um, some of it is dark matters, and some is dark energy. The dark matter is th the thing that holds th things together. The dark energy is what's pushing the world, you know, to keep it, uh, continue to expand. So what's going to happen in the future? We don't know, and when we talk about the future, we are talking millions and billions of years away. Some people are, are talking about that the world could rip apart. Some people are saying, okay, we are going to grow up to a certain size and stop there. And some people are going to say, say that everything is going to collapse and going to implode back. We don't know. These answers, we try to, 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 to you know, these questions, we try to answer them ourselves. But we are no, no close to finding the answers. We are counting on you, on your generation, to find these answers. In the process of doing all of this, doing all of these studies, we keep on sending say, spacecraft, whether around Earth, around the sun, around the planets, to keep, to keep on looking for clues and answers. Space has offered a good domain and you know, for technology evolution, technology that we can take and then apply in our day-to-day -day life. Your tennis shoes, your radios, your smartphone, that all comes from space-related technology. So space has a place for all of you. And I'm hoping that you'll all participate in our exploration and come along on our journey to discover the unknown. So follow our exploration. You can. Go to our website and get a lot more information.